Hello and welcome back to Planet Nibiru. As always, I'd like to thank all of our subscribers and viewers for watching and commenting on our videos and making our community possible. Today we will be revisiting a subject per viewer request. When I did my first video on this, I received an amazing amount of feedback, both positive and negative. I was bombarded with requests to do a follow-up video told the complete story of the homunculus experiments, and so that is what I am here to do. In order to lay the groundwork for our story, we will begin by briefly discussing the history of crossbreeding, DNA experimentation, and the pros and cons of this field of study. In this original video about the homunculus, we mentioned that it is a chimera of sorts, made up of fertilizing a chicken egg with human sperm. The response was so explosive with folks offering up their opinions from every side of the spectrum, legal, ethical, social, religious, and so on. Those who viewed it as good recognized that we were advancing science, pushing the boundaries in order to expand our knowledge. Others saw it as an attempt to play God and leaned towards the belief that there are some lines which should never be crossed. These folks in the second group point to things like the Chupacabra, the Montauk Monster, and others which are almost certainly genetic experiments that have gone wrong and gotten loose somehow. They look at what science has done above board for all the world to see and wonder what has been done in secret that the world knows nothing of. You see, crossbreeding has been around for a long, long time. The first mule dates back some 3,000 years before Christ walked the earth. That is almost 6,000 years ago. Dogs have been crossbred for many, many, many years for various purposes, from hunting to designer dogs that can be carried around and pampered much like a child. Similarly, we have been using genetics to attack a wide variety of problems worldwide. From stem cells to full organs, we are growing them in animals. We have genetically modified foods that are resistant to bugs and pesticides and drought. This helps us ease hunger and famine. We have used genetics to solve creative problems like making light. Using the DNA from a fish that lives at the bottom of the ocean and secretes bioluminescence from its skin, creating its own light and amplifying any ambient light available so it can see in the depths of the oceans. We have taken this DNA and infused it into trees that line certain runways, and when planes come in for a landing at night, the trees provide extra natural light and reflect the light from the plane back onto the runway itself. This has worked so well that researchers from Cambridge, Stanford, and Biolab in California have begun creating trees that will one day replace light poles altogether. Again, these are the projects that we know about, the ones that they tell us about. Never mind the black projects that we never hear about because of military secrecy and ethical objections. One quick example would be the Humanzi that was attempted by scientists working for Joseph Stalin, who was seeking a super soldier. One who could fight with the strength of ten men. One with no fear or sympathy. One who never complained. A ruthless killing machine that would follow orders and gladly give its life to accomplish its mission. According to Wikipedia, there have been no scientifically verified specimens of a human-chimp hybrid but there have been substantiated reports of unsuccessful attempts at human-chimpanzee hybridization in the Soviet Union in the 1920s, and various unsubstantiated reports on similar attempts during the second half of the 20th century. The project met with many problems in the lab, and time and time again it was said that the only way to attempt a real crossbreed between chimps and humans was to try a live birth after normal gestation. Russian leadership quickly shut down this idea. Officially, the Humanity Project was scrapped due to lack of progress and the scientist was banished to Siberia, where he worked at the Kazakh Veterinary Zoological Institute. It is here that it is said he carried out his nefarious work. Inseminating 
young volunteer f Russian females with the sperm of a chimpanzee. The official records indicate that there were no results from these tests and that Ilya Ivanovich Ivanov died of a stroke two years later. The story of the Humanzies should end here, but there is one more curiosity that we must mention before we move on to the story of the Humunculus. In this same area of Siberia, about 40 years earlier, there was a local legend of an ape woman who was covered in hair and was extremely large and lived in the wild in the area. A few attempts were made to capture her, but she was very hard to subdue. She could run as fast as a horse and possess the strength of many, many men. The ape woman, who locals named Xana, was known for scavenging in their waste in their dump area, and villagers designed a clever trap that managed to capture the wild woman. It took them years of caging her, but eventually she became docile and was taught to do menial tasks around the village. She could carry much, much more water or wood than any two men together, and she was given shelter in the blacksmith's shed, where she lived for the rest of her life. From time to time, some of the drunken village men would have sex with Xana, who did not seem to mind the act. Remember, she could have literally tore them in half if she so desired. After living freely in the village for close to 10 years, Xana showed signs of pregnancy. By all accounts, she worked up until the day that she had the child and was back working a day or two later. It was decided by the village elders that the boy should be taken in and raised by the community as he showed no abnormal features other than being a large boy with rather pronounced facial features like a thick brow over his large eyes. He was also a bit hairy for a child, but otherwise perfectly normal. Growing up, he displayed the same strength as his mother, yet he was a regular member of the community. His name was Quit, and both he and his mother are both staples of Russian Bigfoot lore. I tell this story to illustrate that genetic manipulation can end up having positive effects as well as negative ones. It's not always some type of Frankenstein type ending. So now, on to the complete story of the homunculus that the alchemist Corny has made. First, let's address the possibility of such a thing. Scientists in the UK have been creating human-chicken hybrids for years in labs to create stem cells for research on fighting diseases, etc. In fact, three universities in the United Kingdom have created human-animal embryonic mergers with over 150 animals to date. The system that Corny uses to produce his homunculi is called hybrid embryonics. A hybrid embryo is a mixture of both human and animal tissue. There are several types of embryonic mergers, but this particular controversy has focused on hybrid embryos. Hybrid embryos are created by mixing human sperm and animal eggs, or human eggs and animal sperm, to create a chimera. This method has been used by doctors and scientists for years to produce stem cells for use in research. So yes, the creation of a chimera, or animals that didn't exist before, is completely possible, evidenced by the fact that we have been doing it for years. The question is, what is the limit? What does it take to do something of this nature, and can it be done without special equipment? This brings us to the story of Corny the Alchemist. He has seemingly created a new type of life form from an egg and human sperm. Yes, of course, they have to be farm fresh eggs straight from the chicken with no tampering whatsoever. He then files a small hole in the eggshell and injects his own sperm into the egg, covers the area with a band-aid, and waits 40 days until he removes the creature. Of course, he does lose some, and very few scientific studies work 100% of the time, so this is no exception. He soon realized his dream, though, and created one that is still alive and moving. Much to the disappointment of the viewer though, he kills this first one as it seems to spit something at him and he is unprepared for this to happen. He smashes the first one with a book, but he is undeterred in his efforts and makes another one which we have come to know as Pikachu. The first one that makes it past the initial stage of life seems to develop a rudimentary mouth and tongue which it uses to eat as it grows.
After a few more tries, he creates a second one named Slowpoke, which grows strong and displays a completely different body style. The second one absorbs food through its skin instead of a mouth. It did not grow a mouth, however it has grown an eyeball. Now the eyeball is a truly miraculous development because a rudimentary animal like this usually doesn't develop a highly evolved organ like an eyeball. The eyeball can be seen following the alchemist's hand as he moves it and also can be observed just looking around at its surroundings. Now the true magic seems to begin happening when the two are placed in the same container. This was Corny's original intent when creating it. He wanted to study how they would interact with each other socially. And let's just say that he did get a show. For the first few days, nothing changed at all. Neither organism moved in any direction. Then Pikachu, the tall one with the mouth, began mo slowly moving towards Slowpoke. This happened ever so gradually at first, just a few centimeters a day. Then one day, the alchemist's grandson called him at work and told him to come home quickly because something was happening with the homunculi. When Quinny arrived home, he found that Pikachu had bent his head over and had attached himself to Slowpoke. Quinny thought that this was the end for Slowpoke. He believed that Pikachu was going to eat Slowpoke. But after about a week or so, with little change to the two, with the exception that Slowpoke's eye had grown some sort of protective lid over it, he thought that perhaps they were mating. He gave it another week, and then ruled out mating for several reasons. First, he reasoned that no mating ritual would last this long, and second, it appears that Pikachu was burying his head into Slowpoke. He did not know what to make of it at this point and just decided to keep watching. After a few more weeks go by, it is plain to see that the creatures are now merging. He believes that they are merging at the nervous system level and allowing them to become a single entity. To test this theory, he takes a brush and pokes the remaining piece of Pikachu that is still exposed. That part of Pikachu moves independently. Then taking the same brush, he pokes the much larger and much more complete Slowpoke, and both creatures move in unison. This proves to him that his assumptions are correct, and they are indeed merging at the nervous system level. This is astounding to both the alchemist and to those of us who are following his work. We have witnessed two very simple life forms created, grown, advanced, and merging with one another to create something more than what they were to begin with. To all those who watch his work on a regular basis, we stand in awe at what we are witnessing. There are a few who watch who are of dissenting opinions and they are welcome because Corny appreciates the gravity of what he is doing and he welcomes their criticism and handles it probably much better than I would. He aims to keep everything scientific and above board and simply asks them for scientific proof to back up what they say. This is a much more calm and fair-handed approach than what I could muster. So now that you know the entire story, please let me hear back from you and let me know what you think. Now that you can see the entire process, and what has become of the two creatures once they were in the same tank, what do you think will happen from here? In any event, I'd love to hear what you think. With that, I will wrap this up and say thank you for viewing, thank you for all of your likes, subscribes, and comments, and we will be back soon with another video.